Hey, kids, and welcome. It is this week's episode of Conscious Embodiment Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. It is November 7th through the 13th that we're talking about astrologically today. And oh, man, are we in it. We are in it. In fact, Zoe and I were chatting before we started recording, and we were just checking in with each other, and we were both in such challenging places. I kind of wanted to start there a little bit. I mean, here's the thing, kids, and, and you, Zoe, too, as well. And me, I'm looking in the mirror and talking to myself here. We are being asked to die during this eclipse season. We are truly being asked to drop into levels of change and transformation that feel like death. That's the essence of the Scorpio mansion. And our aliveness, our vibrancy in, in embodiment, as my moniker likes to talk about, I am the ambassador of conscious embodiment. <laughs> well, that's all Mars, pure Mars action, right? Mars is, you know, Mars is the planet of the present moment because in Venus rules how our emotional body gives us data. Mercury is about how we navigate and sort of, advance our movement through through thought and remember the mind mercury can travel back and forth through time mars is the only planet in time and he ain't moving so we've got our bodies are like strapped no. down right he's still not moving back. <laughs> one of the things we're going to talk about today is is that he's finally going to get moving a little bit in the next day or two but really and truly he has not been moving uh, uh, from about you know seven days before he turned around on the 30th and uh, about seven days after, which is like right around now. In fact, Tuesday, I think of this week, the planet Mars will move to 20, like four degrees uh, um, after sitting at 25 degrees for like 10, 11 days. Right. Mm -hmm. So think of it this way, Zoe. If Mars is the body and how we live in the present moment and he ain't moving, that means we're not moving. We are okay. not living our embodied lives at our regular pace. Mars said, we're going into the below. We're doing a process. It's going to include lots of thoughts and, and patterns of the mind because mm -hmm. Mars is in Gemini. And due to this phenomenon of the appearance of, of backwards motion, he's been at 25 degrees for. E -e ever. So that's like being strapped into the table, not being able to move, ready for the psychic surgery that then eclipse season tells us is coming along. And that surgery is at the level of death and rebirth. And I, 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 I that, 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 that's like trope ish language, but I, I, I really mean to emphasize the, the, the intensity behind that phrase, death and rebirth, because that's how deep these changes that we're moving through right now are going through. And I know that you've been in, in quite a personal story of that yourself. Yeah. And it's, it's been brutal. And guess what? It's going to get, it's going to get challenged worse this coming week. And I'm hoping I just have more skills and experience to take on this week better. You know, I've had a few weeks where it's like, hard for me to to be handling my day-to-day -day, you know um well you're just... going through an actual grieving loss we talked a little bit about last week and it's still going on for you yeah yeah and i'm still feeling those grieving feelings you know um and trying to make sense of what that person meant to me you know also understanding what that person meant to me is part of my journey um 
because, you know, denying, it was easy when you have someone in front of you and you're like, oh yeah, we're pals, you know? And you can kind of deny the severity of the deepness of your connection or what that person means to you, you know? Like if you don't want to, quote, go there. Right, you don't right, have to. Right, You're right, just right. like, you don't we have, have a to, great time. Just, right, I'd it's like established. You I'm connected. <laughs> we have an experience of a relationship. It's there. I think about it sometimes, but not always. And then it's taken away. And that's hard. And then you're faced with, this is what that meant, you know? And you have to go that deep because you're like, why am I being so affected by this, you know? And you're like, <laughs> oh, like, I love that person. And oh, that person did this for me and played this role, you know? And with that person now gone, the self, you as the self experiencing the loss, you have to reorient how you understand yourself with a significant part of you now gone, now missing, now has gone away, and you have to grow into that space. And this is true whether we're talking about the sort of loveliness of a deep grief that comes because there was great love, mm -hmm. or we're just bumping into our challenges uh, uh, during eclipse season and facing the ways that we have to let certain aspects of self die and be reborn, even when we're talking about patterns of behavior that don't serve us. Every time we change, even if we're letting go of something that we are well served to let go of, it's still a death. Change yeah. is death. And the mind, Gemini, grips our patterns and say and says to us, like, don't change this. Change is scary. I gotta mm -hmm. keep things the way they were. And of course, nothing, nothing will be the same after we get through the end of this year and this incredible eclipse season. But yeah, my DMs and my emails have just been exploding with people who are exhausted, people who are ill, people who are bedridden, both sort of Ew, physically and psychically and emotionally. Yeah, I had, yeah. A, I had my first cold <laughs> in three years. Yeah, Remember that doesn't cold? happen. Yeah, well, I don't go <laughs> anywhere. Like, I, I don't leave the house ever. Like, the, the pandemic allowed my sort of hermit badge to fly, you know, f at full tilt. And so because I don't interact with people as much, I haven't, I haven't had a cold in three years. And it was just so bizarre to get sick and have it be a cold. And, and it happened just as Mars was stationing to turn around. Like the, so when yeah. the planet of the body was like, all right, we're crankily turning direction. I was like, okay, I'm getting into bed for two and a half days. So I want to say this about some of the change and transformation that we're in because really and truly last week was brutal. And this week that we're in now is more intense because we're hitting the next eclipse um, in the full moon that's tomorrow. So hmm. there's also a triggering of, of the fixed cross between Saturn and Uranus at the end of the week, which I'll talk about a few minutes down the pike in the podcast. But like the geometry of this week is more difficult than the geometry of last week. But something that you said, Zoe, is important to sort of codify and put out there. It's like how we met last week will help how we meet this week. That's what I'm hoping. Well, think about it. If the new moon kicks us off into what the lunar cycle is going to bring, it is the full moon that is the direct release experience that correlates to the energy of the lunar cycle that we're in, right? In other words, mm -hmm. if the lunar cycle is an eclipse and it's a new moon in Scorpio, we know we're headed for a big death rebirth experience. The full moon's going to be the peak. The full moon's going to be the mm -hmm. apex because it's a full moon. Yeah. So that's tomorrow. So <laughs> we are in the build of the more intense moment, perhaps the biggest intense moment of this month. But we don't do that in a vacuum. Like we don't go from new moon to full moon in an instant. We inch there day by day over two weeks time. And so all of the difficulties of last week were part of the release that this full moon was designed to generate. It's not separate, right? So mm -hmm. we don't go into this week and tomorrow's full moon as if we just arrived at the theater and the show's about to begin, right? It's the second act. This intermission has happened. We are already in process. 
And so because we're already in a process that is discombobulating, brutal at times, emotionally draining, transformative in nature, we are inching towards the peak of that that happens to be this week. But it, it, it should parlay on top of what we were prepared with last week. So I want to talk about two ancillary things that are happening uh, in the first couple of days of this week that are connected to the eclipse, but I'm going to talk about separately. We've already hinted at one of them, and that is Mars is finally going to move on Wednesday to 24 degrees of Gemini. So that means that his, his station is officially over, that period of time where he's just not moving at all. So what this signals is that we are coming out of the baffling challenges of Mars not moving. Now, Mars will be retrograde for two and a half months in total. That's a very long period of time for a planet that's personal, that impacts us all very directly at the personal level to be in the unconscious spaces of a retrograde journey. But the turnaround is so much harder than the actual backward movement. Like, this is true about when Mercury goes retrograde and direct. In fact, when Mercury turns around and sort of stands still for like two or three days during his retrograde cycle, that period of time with Mercury not moving is considered so discombobulating, it has its own name. It's called the storm cycle. Yikes. Yeah, yeah. Well, think about it. You know, <laughs> communication and communication challenges do create sort of conflicts and like stormy, you know, words between not only people, but words between your own ears, right? So the way yeah. we move through those cranky couple of days knocks us off balance in, in the world of mind and thought. And the same thing is true of Mars, only it's much, much bigger in its impact. Because Mars is our energy, it's our good or bad feeling in the body itself. And this is why so many people have been DMing me and, and emailing me about, I mean, this is the question I get a lot on social media is, you know, like, is it normal for me to feel this tired? I haven't gotten out of bed in three days. And it's like, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think like we forget because capitalism that there are ups and downs to everything including our physicality and including our emotion you know i'm so glad you mentioned that so because truly the value of mars going retrograde in gemini is that it's going to tell us it's going to show us it's going to reveal to us our thoughts about limitations in movement, energy, physical resources. Hmm. And the, you know, you, you use the word capitalism and, 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 and what I talk about is productivity as the only coin of the realm, which of course is because of capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> so because of capitalism, we value getting shit done so much so that we've lost a uh, a connection that the body knows organically, which is rhythm. Yeah. Sometimes the body just needs to be quiet because that's what the body needs and wants. And so your unconscious will create circumstances to generate that. But very often it's because we're fighting against the natural inclinations to rest, to not judge stillness and slowness, to, to, to be in acceptance of those moments when the body says, I can't do this today, right? Yeah. And we argue with that greatly, and Gemini is the arguing <laughs> archetype. And so it's, it's important for you listening out there to notice what you're saying to yourself about your body's needs and demands at this time. And are you finding a grace with allowing the body to dictate what a moment needs rather than your mind. Hmm. That's a big theme over the next couple of months will be 
can you learn the language of your body's information that it offers you and follow it because that's how we connect to flow more directly when we allow the body to sort of inform us what it wants at any given moment. Now, something else that's building tomorrow is a uh, mental guidance experience. Mercury and the sun are coming together in their regular, what's called superior conjunction. Mercury and the sun are never very far from each other because he's so close and such a fast orbit. And from our perspective, as we look up into the cosmos, we would never see Mercury more than about 17 degrees in front of or behind the sun. And so every two months when Mercury is in the free and clear period as he is now, like no, no retrograde and insight, he connects with the sun in what we call the superior conjunction where it's Earth, Sun, and Mercury on the other side. Mm -hmm. This is a moment of uh, guidance, you know? The Sun is your conscious awareness. Mercury is the guidance mechanism that sort of narrates the experience and sort of runs off with it sometimes. <laughs> but when the Sun and Mercury come together, there's an alignment of awareness and navigation mechanism that we experience as guidance messages, you know, sideways experiences like synchronicities that inform us or happy accidents. These kinds of things come up during the conjunction between Mercury and the sun. Now, when Mercury's retrograde, this is a little bit more important. I make a little bit bigger deal of it because Mercury's in the below. He's in the unconscious during a retrograde. And so when the sun and Mercury retrograde line up, we have to listen a little harder for the guidance and it's coming from a deeper place and it has maybe more significance when Mercury's retrograde, but it's still an important moment to notice and honor when Mercury's free and clear because this distinction between our awareness and our thinking is not something we're all that aware of. A lot of people are still identifying with their thoughts as if what they're thinking is, you know, everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that takes work, Michael. <laughs> I'm oh my effing God, Zoe. I'm 59 years fucking old, and I feel like I just learned how to do this in the last 10 or 15 years of my life, and I've been working on this thing called consciousness since I was a teenager. Yeah. It is a long ass, you know, job to work on this. What Life what's long. one of the tropes like don't believe everything you think? Mm -hmm. That's a disconnect between conscious awareness and thought. Yeah. So that when sun and mercury come together, there's less of an opportunity to be thinking beyond your conscious awareness and there's value in this. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I'm sort of presenting this to you, my listeners today, of this superior conjunction that's happening tomorrow, where there will be, in fact, some guidance messages that might come through happenstances or synchronicities or sideways communications. But it's also smack dab in the middle of the full moon eclipse. So tapping into that still small voice may be in difficult when you're also tumbling through the, <laughs> the mechanism of an eclipse designed to transform your life radically. But it's in there, and I wanted to make sure that we talked a little bit about this before we unpack all of the energy around tomorrow's full moon in Taurus. Oh, I kind of love that it's in Taurus because Taurus is cozy. We're also going into cozy season here in the Northern Hemisphere. And I feel like all of this emotional stuff going on makes me want to get into bed, which I would do <laughs> for cozy season anyway. So cozy season. I, this feels all in alignment. Well, here's the only wrench I'm going to throw in, in the mix there for you, Zoe, because you're right. Taurus is a cozy, comforting, sen you know, sensual sign. But this eclipse, man, this full moon, like this is a psychic surgery, honey. Like this is a... 
This is a, uh, you better let every idea you have about what love looks like, what partnership and relationship looks like, what cozying up with another human being looks like, because all of it is subject to radically change during this lunar cycle. <laughs> <laughs> That feels ominous. Well, and I, I, I'm going to leave that on the table, that, that ominous feeling. So I, I, my, my caretaking impulses want to sort of backtrack and say, well, wait, 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 wait. Don't worry. It's not so ominous. But I can't because it's freaking ominous. Right. It is ominous. Scorpio is the archetype that invented death and rebirth. And so Taurus is the archetype of the opposite of that. Like if, if Scorpio says we have to die to be here, Taurus is all of the yummy of what it is mm -hmm. to be here. Right. In fact, if we think of Taurus as the second sign of the Zodiac, mm. it's Aries that bursts through and says, I am and then it's immediately Taurus that comes next and says, well, if I am, where am I? And Taurus invented the earth herself. So that embrace of Mother Earth that we then translate into the embrace of other human beings, Taurus is where it becomes worth coming here. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. That feels so emotional. It's like, maybe, yeah, maybe our human experience was worth the trip. Well, Taurus is where we get that. I mean, if you, one of my favorite movies ever is The Fifth Element. And of course, what the message is at the end of The Fifth Element, it's just a space age kind of farcical, fun little romp with Bruce Willis. And it's this idea that there are these five elements. We understand the four elements of, you know, earth, wind, air, and, you know, earth, earth, fire, water, and, and, um, Earth, fire, water, air. air. <laughs> like, so all of the elements in the four element system that we use in astrology, there's this fifth element. And of course, we discover what it is in the last two minutes of the movie. And it's, of course, oh, now I'm going to cry. <laughs> Love. Right? Mm. That it's, in fact, this creature discovers, you know, war because she's learning the world from A to Z because she's going through like the encyclopedia. And at the end of the movie, she gets to W and learns about war. And she's like, fuck this. Why should I help you guys? You destroy everything. Yeah. And of course, the answer is, but there's love. And this is that eclipse. Scorpio is that everything is ultimately destroyed, that nothing we create can last, that everything we do must die, including us. And Taurus says it's worth it. Taurus says do it anyway. Now, why this particular eclipse is so extra, extra is A, it's a south node eclipse. It means the sun is near the south node of the moon. The south node is about the past and all of the baggage that we must let go of in order to have that love experience that you and I are talking about right now. Yeah. So nobody's escaping that if we want to have more love with a capital L, that we have to die to some element of self. And because Mercury and Venus are both in Scorpio with the sun, that means our thinking and perceiving and how we literally give and receive love are what are gathering in the death rebirth sign. So we are dying to not only how we are aware of who we are, sun, we are dying to how we think, perceive, and communicate. Mercury, we are dying to how we process our emotions and actually give and receive love at the personal level. That amplifies what's being asked to die and be reborn is everything about how you think and feel about who you are. Hmm. Then across the cosmos, in Taurus, where the moon is, the planet Uranus has been hanging around for a couple of years. Uranus is the great awakener. He's the five-dimensional consciousness that demands, in fact, that we wake up to higher levels of our awareness. And my joke about Uranus is he doesn't give a shit how he does it. Like the, 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 the dad joke I use in sessions, <laughs> I still use this even though it's so stupid. 
It's like Uranus wants you to wake up. You win the lottery and you lose your legs in a boating accident and you're both going to wake up. Have at it. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I've heard you do. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Say a, that you one. know, listen, if a joke, if, it, if someone laughed at a joke once in like 1997, I'm still using it today. <laughs> <laughs> So, but the point is that when Uranus is in the house, we don't get to choose how we wake up, but we can guarantee that we are. And because Uranus sort of operates in the sudden and the unexpected and the wild card energy, his presence in this eclipse amplifies the possibility that things can come and go very suddenly during this lunar cycle and eclipse season. There are relationships mm -hmm. because Venus is involved. It's very much about love and relationships are going to start up out of nowhere in this uh, eclipse season and end out of nowhere in this eclipse season. Mm. And again, I, it, it sounds like I'm always talking about romantic relationships when I talk about Venus and love and relationships, but I'm talking about all manner of love in the heart is subject to dying to self so that we can make more room for greater love. And Uranus ensures that absolutely anything can happen in order to facilitate that possibility. And because I'm obsessed with the precision of geometry, the fact that the full moon is at 16 degrees of Taurus and Uranus is at 16 degrees of Taurus, this full moon means business, kids. Hmm. And shit can happen that's sudden, unexpected, discombobulating, absolutely knocking you on your ass kinds of changes and transformations. Now, yes, Uranus brings the sudden and unexpected, but, you know, we're also in a narrative that unfolds day to day. So, yes, things can happen that you didn't see coming this coming week. But as you and I talked about earlier in the pod today, Zoe, we're, we're moving through a process that has a kind of a loosely beginning, middle, and end, meaning we're not just facing tomorrow's full moon in a vacuum and brand new. We, we've been inching toward it. And still, Uranus in the house means the sudden and unexpected are possible. And it could also be that the surprising wild card energy that this full moon is going to bring has already played out with sudden shifts and changes that have happened over the last two weeks. But the close proximity of moon, Uranus, and north node, remember the north node is about our future, that Anything that we are able to drop and release and let die is going to propel us powerfully forward because of the connection between the moon and Uranus being with the north node of the moon. This is why eclipses are so powerful, because the lunations happen near the nodes. And that's why we put so much, so much emphasis in astrology about what sign the nodes are in because they determine where the eclipses are going to be over an 18-month period. And we are in that, you know, rock'em, sock'em peak. And we still have one more eclipse season in this same trajectory of South Node in Scorpio, North Node in Taurus in the spring of next year. So we're not quite done with the deep sort of change and transformation eclipses that we're, that we're going to be going through. But I would say that oh, I haven't dove in yet to next year's, you know, uh, lunations. I don't think that next year's eclipses in, this, in these signs are going to be as intense as this one. And part of why I say that is because next eclipse season in the spring of 23 is a north node eclipse, meaning the sun will be near the forward moving trajectory energy of the nodes rather than in the past. I think it's harder to let go of the past than it is to meet the future. We get excited about future possibilities, but here's what really counts. The forward-moving eclipse power of April 2023 will 
largely depend on how much you allow this eclipse season to just eviscerate you. Oh, oh. oh, really and truly, let that shit die as deeply as you can, because when we get six months from now and the eclipse season is about hurtling forward into brand new territory, the lighter we are at that eclipse, the further we'll go. And this is the eclipse where we get rid of the dead weight of old patterns, habits, and ways of being in the world that we want to be healed from. So the last thing I want to add about this eclipse is something I've been talking about really since late August when I introduced you all to the fact that Chiron, the great healer, has been in conjuncting the south node in Scorpio for the last, like, two plus months and will continue through the end of the year. Chiron is the healing presence energy. And in Aries, the healings that we go through are done by fire. <laughs> like this is not a gentle passage with Chiron uh, uh, through Aries because the, you know, the, the planet has to operate through the lens of the sign it's in. And if the, the, the sign is Aries, which is all about fire and action, then our healings are a little bit more sort of combustible. And that in conjunct, that great eliminator angle with the south node means we are meaning it with, with deep intensity, a willingness to go into the most tender places where healings are really painful and we're able to. We're able to do with some grace that we might have been attempting to do for a long time. I, I, most of the people in my world are not new to the idea of healing their wounds. This season kind of means business partly because right. of Chiron and Aries in conjuncting Scorpio South Node. But what I want to add to your thoughts about this eclipse and Mars's retrograde cycle is that Aries is the sign that Mars rules. Chiron is in Aries. That means his mm. disposition, the disposition that Chiron has right now comes from Mars, the ruler of the physical body. That planet is retrograde now, meaning dropped into the below. The relationship between Mars in his retrograde and Chiron is a 60-degree sextile. That's a productive and creative energy between the healer and the embodiment planet. So while there's a peak of like what I've been calling a psychic surgery with this full moon and the eclipse cycle that we are in, the healing consciousness that we allow right now during this eclipse season will be carried by Mars and Chiron in their interaction over the next couple of months, which means that the more courageously and thoroughly we are willing to surrender to the deep and potentially painful healing experiences of this lunar cycle, the more powerfully the Mars retrograde is going to help us change our behaviors over the next couple of months so that when Mars emerges out of this cycle, which he does next spring, right before the next eclipse, we are empowered to move forward more powerfully because we're willing to do the hard healing work as we go. I have to point out that the week... <laughs> I'm so sorry, kids. <laughs> it's going to be a rough week beyond the eclipse. Oh, oh man. So, <laughs> all right. So it's going to be a rough, like, uh, 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 Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Beyond the eclipse energy of Tuesday, we also have a triggering of the square 
that's finely diminishing between Saturn and Uranus, but it ain't diminished enough <laughs> that it can't be triggered. So let me break this down for you guys a little bit. Last year, Saturn, the teacher, and Uranus, the great awakener, came into a square, 90 degree angle. 90 degrees is a geometry of conflict and obstacle that teaches us, right? There's no, it's not random when planets square. They're like designed to like set up obstacles and conflicts through which we either learn something or get to a desired like goal. Stephanie Azaria created the most beautiful imagery for this by calling squares stepping stones. Now I've used this analogy on this podcast where you want to get across the like the little river you've come to. Mm. You can because there are these stepping stones across the river. You can see them. And you'll be able to navigate them. But they're differently spaced. They're at different angles. They're covered with moss and running water, so they're slippery as all fuck. But you can do it. You might fall, and you might get wet. But you will get across the river if you honor the obstacles and the conflicts and the lessons that they're bringing. Saturn wants us to be wiser. Uranus wants us to be woke. In a square, they're both efforting to get us wiser and awakened to a higher level of awareness, but through conflict. And if you look at last year and this year, just in terms of like the news cycle and how we've reacted to it, that tells the story of Saturn and Uranus in a square. It's like conflict and obstacle is flipping everywhere. And we are still being charged to rise up to a higher level of operating and awareness, even though the world seems to be falling apart. So the geometry of 90 degrees was exact between these two planets in 2022, and it's starting to separate. They're starting to get further away. So the square is diminishing. In fact, when Saturn went direct about a week or so ago, that signaled the official end of the square because Saturn will keep moving. And by the time he gets ready to turn around and go retrograde again next year, he will be far enough from Uranus that they will not revisit that square again. So while that square hasn't been at a perfect 90 degrees all year, they're close enough that when a transiting planet squares one and then the other, it just separates the square over two or three days instead of simultaneous. Hmm. So right after the eclipse, Mercury is going to oppose Uranus and the next day on Wednesday square Saturn. Wednesday is when the sun opposition to Uranus peaks and hmm. Friday is the square from the sun to Saturn. So this means that every day from the start of Eclipse Day on Tuesday through Friday, we are also bumping into tremendous slowdowns, breakdowns, and lessons from a Saturnian expective perspective and sudden, unexpected wildcard pivots. I didn't see that coming from Uranus's perspective. It's a shit show of a week, kids. I, there's just no way around it. So breathe, move slow, drop into your spiritual practice with gusto, rely on each other in community and loving connections. You know, this is all about how we give and receive mm. love, kids. And remember, at a full moon eclipse, we're not just suffering the release mechanism. We're also charged with gratitude. What's the harvest? What, what's the crop that you're ready to benefit? Where is the love now that you feel every day of your life in this moment? It's really important as we move through this week that's going to be energetically difficult that we also remember to, to focus on the amazing amount of love that you already have flowing through your live stream at this time. And the more we lift ourselves up with the gratitude we are feeling, the more graceful, and I hate to use this word easy, but for the sake of shorthand, the easier the release mechanism will be. 
It's all about the giving and receiving of love and becoming mm. better at that. Have at it, kids. All right, it's dream segment time. Every week, Dr. Michael will interpret dreams that are sent in via email or take a live caller. If you would like your dream interpreted on the podcast, you can go ahead and email us at dreams at michaelenix.com. Hopefully your dream will make it onto the show. This week, we have a call-in dreamer from Los Angeles, our home. Michael and I are both based in LA, and we have Anna calling in from K-Town, I believe. Hey, Anna, how's it going? Hi, it's going good. Yes, from K-Town. Thank you for having me. Can't park in K-Town, honey. <laughs> but I have a parking space. I have a parking yes, space. Yes, that's the only way to live there. Oh, nice. All right. Nice. Yes. <laughs> And I understand yeah. you're a bit of a clairvoyant or in touch with other realms. So, Anna, what you dreaming? So, uh, what am I dreaming? I my most bizarre dream um, up to date was, and I have shared the story recently too with um, someone else about um, was during a time when I was using tarot cards. Love that. And it was one particular night where I dreamt that I was in my room, but I'm going to assume it was, and this is where you guys are going to help me <laughs> figure out yeah, what maybe. this is. I, it, it almost like the dream felt like I was in a different dimension because it was still my room, but all the furniture was gone and it was blue. The room was all the whole, like the lighting was blue. And I, there was a window seat in my room and uh, I was sitting there and I was sitting with someone else who intuitively, instinctively, I don't know. It felt like a powerful being. I almost thought it was like an angel um, because he had blonde hair, blue eyes, was white. And I remember <laughs> thinking like, this is so cliche. <laughs> this is so cliche. Like if this is an angel, this is so cliche. And, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> right? And like, and here's the thing. I was acting like my normal self. I'm a very giggly person. Mm. And so I was just like, oh, my God, like, who are you? <laughs> Here's the thing, though. We had a whole conversation to which I understand he, I think he, because he didn't really seem like to have a gender, but I'm going to say he. He, like, told me, like, how, like, the universe works, the world works. I don't remember what the conversation yeah. went. He was also very serious. I was being silly, and he was just deadpan. And I was like, Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let me behave. Let me behave better. The one thing I can remember and I will tell you was I asked him, like, so you're not alone? Mm. He's like, no, there's seven of us. And to which I was like, okay. Mm. And the thing is, I've had similar dreams where someone visits me in my sleep. And when I was a little girl, that um, happened twice. So. It felt familiar. The voice felt familiar. Mm. And I didn't get a good feeling about it. You mean when you were younger and you when had I was those younger sort of too. sense of visitations, you didn't feel good about it? Or are you talking about this dream? Both. All, there was oh. three dreams total. Got it. So being raised Catholic, my immediate reaction was to pray. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what this is, but it reminds me of that time. And I was remember being scared, and I don't know what to do, so I prayed, and then he got upset with me. And that's how, like, the dream, like, abruptly ended, and the last thing I heard was, like, growling in my ear. So, let me see if I'm getting this right. In the dream experience with this being, you went into a kind of Catholic version of prayer? Yes. And he kind of objected. Yeah. <laughs> it was weird. 
Yeah. So where are you at now in terms of your understanding of your own spiritual sort of sovereignty and the messages of Catholicism and Christianity? Like, where are you at in, in your development around that? Um. Well, so when I had that dream at the time, I was using tarot cards. Right. So what that led to with actions and spirituality was, I feel like there was a lot of negativity surrounding it. So I just kind of stepped away Mm. To no longer experience those things. Mm. But it's it's just interesting, though, because even as a kid when I had those dreams, um, I wasn't doing anything in particular. I would just have them. But I think I've, I lean more towards just like, because I know with like Christianity and with Catholicism, they're like, let's just avoid right. anything that can break negative right. energy in like that way. And so that's kind of where I lean more now. Um, because that dream was tied in with also a lot of like really weird paranormal experiences in my life. But that dream, I just, I, that is a dream I can never, I can't shake it off because I woke up and it just felt so real. Well, I mean, yeah, you, so you, you're real. talking about yeah. experiences that I have had and heard thousands okay. of, Anna. I have been hearing dreams since I was 16 years old and I'm 59. And I've done this for a living. It's not countable how many dreams I have heard in my life. <clears throat> I'm actually right now writing a book about mystical dream experiences. So right in these last few months, I've read dozens of these kinds of experiences. And they have a similitude to them that set them apart from other dreams. The fact that it happened within the room that you were sleeping in, even though it was dimensionally different, it was in your room. That's a signal yes. that there's some kind of an experience happening because it's not a dream that's taking you to some imagined, you know, location that changes 27 times and it's a clown car and it goes uphill <laughs> and then, you know, turns into an explosion and, right? The typical chaotic dream. It's a simple setting. That's always a signal that we might be in the presence of something greater if the, if the setting is very singular. Then your own perceptions themselves count like boatloads. So even just your language of it felt like a different dimension. On the one hand, you could say, well, what the fuck does that mean? I don't know what that language means, but I know what that means. It's a bona fide scent that doesn't have to have rationality or clarity about it. It's the sense that you're in a multidimensional experience. And I trust that beyond anything else. Like I trust that you mm -hmm. say to me, it felt like I was in another dimension. Because I've heard thousands of people over dozens of, you know, years, you know, describing similar experiences. The blue color, you know, I go to a couple of places is one is the blue is the throat chakra. So this might be an energy that connects to a guidance system that might come through your communication center. That's one little thing I go with blue. Blue is also a color associated with the Archangel Michael. Interesting. That's just so trippy because it's during this time that I was specifically praying to that to to Archangel, Archangel, Michael. Archangel Michael. Oh, you're killing yeah. me, Anna. All right. So there's a mystical sort of um, codification of, uh, of colors and what's called the, the sacred flames that are associated with... Uh, archangels and, and ascended masters. I teach about this in my, in my class, Jumpstarting Your Spiritual Practice, because working with the sacred flames and the archangels was transformative in my path, like a game changer in, in roughly around 2010 and 11. And in this sort of channeled structure um, of these seven sacred flames, blue is the color of the flame associated with Archangel Michael, and it is, it's the, it's, the name of the flame is the will of God. For, for those who are listening to this podcast and be like, well, what are you talking about? I will say this, many, many, many people in the spiritual path have heard of the violet flame. Um, so if you're listening to this podcast and you've heard of the violet flame, understand that's only one of seven, and the the violet flame is about transmutation, like changing the unchangeable, healing wounds, like transforming things. And so the violet flame is talked a little bit about, you know, talked about in the woo-woo circles as this sacred flame of transformation. But there are six others, and the blue one 
is about connecting to what Archangel Michael brings to us, which is to know the will of God directly. And then he said that there were seven of them, and you're saying there's seven? Wait a minute. He told you there were seven? Remember, I, I didn't. I don't know where that came from. I just, what I remember. Oh, wait, wait, yes. I got it in my notes. Was, he said there are seven of us. Yes, seven of us. All right, you're yeah. fucking killing me, Anna. There are seven sacred flames in this. <laughs> listen, I use this book, which I, I tell people I hate and love. And this is what's, oh, my God, Anna, you're killing me. One of the reasons why I don't like this book, and I talk about it when I teach about it, I, 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 I offer the book and the teachings because they changed my life radically, but one of the reasons I can't stand this book is it's illustrated. And every single one of the ascended masters and archangels that they present is white. And I look at that and I go like, they're not freaking white, that's a human construct. Why are they white? But there are seven of them, and they're presented as white. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what you're connecting with. The fact that you're here, that you've had this dream that's never left your consciousness, and it connects to so many things that are part of what I teach and how I move about my spiritual practice. I think you were having a dream about Archangel Michael. I think that it's a bridging of a gap between the mysticism of Catholicism, which is rich and deep, but then they say, oh no, don't be mystical. Meanwhile, go on Sundays and eat some flesh exactly. and drink some blood. But goodness yeah. knows, don't pick up any fucking tarot cards. <laughs> so I would even say that the grumbling of, of this being as it left you was reflecting the level to which you were still at the time segueing between what is ultimately separation consciousness to a greater experience of connection consciousness. Interesting. That's wild. Sorry. I'm still processing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, honey. Now this is this is this is crazy. I, I, and you know, you do make me feel less crazy. So <laughs> thank you. Well, and you just made me feel sort of that thing I experienced getting like doing what I do. One of the most beautiful things about living this life, working this way with people, uh, uh, you know, as a full time profession for over two decades, is moments like this when crazy synchronicities show up. And then I get to add to it that we're in this transformative, wild eclipse season that we just got done talking about to the, for the podcast listeners. And it, we get to follow it up with a dream experience that's right in the mystical expressions where Scorpio, which is the season we're in, is the sign that invented multidimensionality, the thin veils between worlds. That's all a Scorpio consciousness. So that you are in here on my podcast in Scorpio eclipse season, a day before the full moon, <laughs> that's an eclipse, <laughs> and we're talking about mysticism. I, you just can't make that shit up. I'm, I just... It's okay. It's just, it's insane to me because also it's like, where did I get the number seven from? Like where, you yeah, know, like yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, and that's why it's stuck with me. It just, it's stuck, you know, know, like, I don't know. And also hilarious. Cause I mean, he appeared white to me, but I'm going to assume that <laughs> I'm going to assume that he appears in ways that we probably like expect. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that is true. That there is a, a, a there's a power of the collective, and 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 you, what you just said, you you said it more articulately than I could say it right yeah. now. You know that there's a collision between the purity of what's in multidimensionality. We still have to interpret it through a three dimensional experience of who we are. Mm. Right. So any channeled piece of wisdom gotcha. is always going to be filtered through us. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you, Anna, for, for following the call and joining us today. What a delightful way to wrap up this week's podcast. Thank you for listening to Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. You can find us on Apple Music, the iHeartRadio app, and anywhere you find your favorite shows. Head on over to michaellennox.com for information on astrology readings, the daily astro alert subscription upcoming classes and to join the mailing list